are they game changers? And with the hateful and divisive campaign that he has run. He's got tremendous hatred. When they go low, you go high. Well, well, well. But these millennials are. We are. Rising voices. Get a glimpse of tomorrow's young leaders. The issues that interest you the most. Trying to find a common enemy abroad. It's China-U.S. relations. It's going to hurt China and also hurt the United States. That they join us to unravel the U.S. election wranglings. Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump. But I think Trump has been an outlier in this election. We call them now populists. Election breakdown. A world insight. Welcome to the Rising Voices special program series of World Insight on CCTV News. I'm Tian Wei. Today we are going to focus our attention on the race 2016, the ongoing presidential election, one of the most dramatic elections in contemporary history. And today we are going to do it very differently. Instead of listening to the voices of the political establishments, we are here to listen to the voices of the future generation of young leaders from all over the world. Their analysis about the election, the takeaways, and most importantly, the crucial qualities they consider the political leadership should have for a new world. And that is why we are here in the Schwarzman Scholars Campus of Tsinghua University in Beijing. When it first started the initiative earlier this year, it has got utmost support both from the Chinese and the American president. The Schwarzman scholars are supposed to be a whole new generation of leaders who are going to lead the future with both confidence and sensitivity. They are coming from China, the United States, and about 30 other countries from all over the world. And now, let's go and meet some of them to understand better the breakdown of the election. Hello, class 2016 Schwarzman Scholars. And we are the Rising Voices. Voices. Thank you so much and welcome. <laughs> welcome to Election Breakdown, our special program on World Insight. And with me here, I have three panelists. Juliana Batista coming from the US. How are you? Great today. Great to have you. David Jiang from China. What about you? Awesome. And also Thomas Ferentis Benitez. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, sir. So let's start by talking about the election. Are you nervous about the result? Anxious about the possible result? Juliana? The most fascinating in this election right now is going to be watching the races for the House and Senate. Not only are they important in terms of passing legislation, but they'll be making critical decisions in terms of appointing justices for the Supreme Court, which could set new precedents and it could also overturn previous decisions. What about you, David, coming from China? As a Chinese, I'm a disinterested third party, so I'm not nervous <laughs> at all. But to be honest, I believe in the check and balances in the United States. Yeah, so what, what worse can happen? Oh, what mm. worse can happen? Yep. Meaning? Society is divided during this election, but uh, needs to be stick together. And that's hopefully the result of the election will demonstrate to the citizens in the United States. Are you going to watch very closely on I November am. the 8th? I am. All right. What about you, Thomas? Argentina, backyard yeah. <laughs> in the United States. Exactly. Well, I have to admit I am a little anxious about this election. Not because of what's going to happen in the United States, because I trust their system to have the right checks and balances that David uh, was saying, but because it's sending a message to the whole world. And um, this is, I think this election is reflecting on a larger trend in the world, that it's showing s how some politicians are becoming more populistic and are appealing to the frustrations of people around the world. So I think this will send a very strong message to the rest of the world. What kind of message, you think? I think the, the right message should be that the leaders have to guide people to, to a better future and not try to divide societies and try to foster resentment and hate between them. All right, if we talk about the elections, it has to be about issues. What are the issues that will interest you the most? Let's go with David first. Yeah, I, I'm worried about protectionism. Uh, in this issue, uh, we are not a disconcerned third party, actually, because China has a lot of export to U.S. The, it's the biggest, largest trade partner of the United States. So if the uh, anti-trade sentiment rise up, then it's going to hurt China and also hurt the United States. So I'm concerned about that. Okay. Juliana, do you share that? 
Well, I actually have been really looking at the domestic issues mm -hmm. in the United States. I just graduated from university and I was student body president there. I had some really amazing yes. encounters. Thank you. And I think what was most difficult is a lot of my peers are graduating from college with mounds of debt and I would help students go through crowdfunding campaigns just to make it through, just to pay for books. And I think both the candidates really need to focus on higher education reform. What sort of alternatives are out there and also how are we going to help students refinance their loans and make sure that their career decisions aren't based on how much money they have to pay But do they college. address that? I actually think that a lot of young voters think that the president isn't going to be able to directly impact their lives and that the government is directly gridlocked and they're not going to be able to experience change. But they're not looking to Washington for solutions and they should be. Should they? I think they should. Everybody's voicing their opinions on Facebook. I think we all have our Facebooks. We scroll through those feeds. We're thinking about what other people are saying, but not everybody's taking direct action. And those really smart minds that are writing great prose on Facebook should be the people that are the change makers in Washington. Well, we, what do you take up, you know, candidates like Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump? Uh, some say they are alternative voices. Others say, well, they're probably going a little bit extreme from your perspective. I think they're going into the extreme of becoming what we call them now populists, and this is not only happening in the United States, but it's also happening in Europe and many other countries. And me coming from Latin America, I, I can tell from a very far distance when someone is uh, trying to appeal to that, because in Latin America we suffered many of those politicians in the past. Um, so and I understand the public they're trying to appeal, and I think it's good that they're making those efforts, but I think it, uh, as being leaders in, in a larger country, they have to acknowledge that um, people have very different opinions. The youth uh, and the young people don't have a monolithic voice. We're very diverse. Uh, in this time where we can access a lot of information, each of us has different and it, our own opinions in every matter. So it's very difficult to, to be able to say, the young people think this, or the young people disagree with this. I think that Donald Trump has been playing into the fear of voters, whereas Bernie Sanders has been playing into the fact that there needs to be more equality among people and that there's divisions among American public. I almost know who you are going to vote for. <laughs> for the election, did you vote already? I am a proud voter of Massachusetts, and I actually submitted my absentee ballot. Good for you. From here, in Beijing. From Beijing, it was a very seamless process. Did you consult some of your friends around? No, I make the decision on my own. I think, especially as young voters, there's so many news sources that are out there. And if you take the time to filter through it and really develop your own opinions, that's the best thing that you can do. Certainly, while the American students on campus are voting for their own president, but for the two of you, Thomas, what about you? Uh, for example, Donald Trump. Uh, temperament, that's the word uh, used at least for him. Uh, what do you make of the rise of such a political leadership in the U.S.? Well, one thing for sure is that uh, he's trying to appeal to people who think uh, the government or the politicians that have been uh, in, different, in, in the United States for many years have not been taking care of them. Uh, I think he's, he's aiming to, to take advantage from that. Uh, the way that he's trying to do it with uh, the policy he's trying to push uh, the divisions he's trying to foster in society, I don't think, are the right ones. Uh, sadly, I think that's happening uh, around the world. From the United States, I think it's uh, much more important that the things uh, don't happen again in the future because everybody's looking at the United States and has been looking at the United States for many, many decades as a model to follow, not only in the political arena, but also in the economic development one. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that uh, we can still uh, look up to the United States uh, as an example. Mm, David, what about to you? Of course, China, U.S., a political system, very different. I will say that it reveals certain issues in the United States. It's called, in Chinese, we have a saying, the jie di qi. In English, it can be translated, you know, stand on the ground rather than in the air. So maybe the elites or the uh, current politicians, they are not representing enough of a certain group of people. They feel that they are left out by the society, by the politics. That's why they are trying to voice their opinions through someone that is not very common to see in the po political world. Mm -hmm. And that issue is not only typical to the United States. Certain group of people feel that in China, like farmers, like labor, uh, so it is important that we, we treat these people seriously and try to address this issue. Do you have a preference between the two candidates? Of course, you're not voting, but you know, just <laughs> from an observer's perspective. Uh, I do believe the answer doesn't lie into the name of the candidate. 
because whoever is going to be the president of the United States, they're going to try to reform the political system to address the issue. Oh, really? Re reform the political system? I do want to build on my other scholars' points. I think that Trump has been an outlier in some respects. He was in a primary with a huge swath of candidates, which gave him an advantage in the Republican election. I also think that he's been an outlier in the sense that he had name recognition before he even began his campaign trail, and he's been able to advantage that in the way that he's used the media. So I think Trump has been an outlier in this election and isn't necessarily a harbinger for elections to come. But the thing is, what's likely in the future that's going to shape the election and to shape the individuals who are candidates of the election. Is it the media or is it the youth, if I could use boldly that word as a whole, or is it the issues? What exactly are the factors shaping eventually how a candidate is being presented to the country and eventually lead the country and also the rest of the world in a way? I think that we can't predict that, and I also think that's why this election has gotten so much international attention. But what I really hope is that the elections in the future are going to be shaped by policy proposals and are also going to be shaped by part bipartisan compromise. And I think that's something that we haven't necessarily seen, but is definitely a hope for the future. Uh, in Marxism, we have a saying that economic <laughs> fundamentals decide the superstructures. Okay, so I great turn to, from yeah, China. I, I turn to will that current situation is a reflection of the economic fundamentals in the past 20 years. So Meaning? Meaning that uh, the globalization has shifted the economic division between countries and the U.S. in the Lower, techni lower technicians and farmers and uh, those people who use their pure labor, they are not getting enough welfare from the pie of globalization. So that's the issue happening. And these people voice their anger, voice their dissatisfaction through this election. And if this issue is not resolved, we're going to see more and more anti-establishment candidates in the future election. That's my opinion. Dissatisfaction important, but at the same time, solutions vis-a-vis -vis dissatisfaction, which one is more important? I think solution is, 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 is the key here. Um, and also, I think this, this election, it, it, may, it may worry us from what we're seeing, but actually, I think it's very positive also that we're living it because as happened in the UK with Brexit, this is a, a wake-up call for, for us young people that we need to get involved. Uh, first of all, we need to get up and go vote when we have to go vote uh, for what we believe in. And also, we need to get involved and not leave politics. Politics is way too important to leave it only for some sector of society. We need to get involved. Need to get involved. What about you? You guys need to get involved in the discussion as well. Anyone want to share with us some of your thoughts? Thank you. I'm Ricky Altieri from the United States. Uh, the discussion has been really interesting so far, and one of the main issues that's come up has been the kind of divisiveness that this politics has brought out. And from my point of view, one thing that's been interesting in this election has been that people from different parties seem to be getting their news from very different sources. So as someone who tends to be left of center, I read the New York Times and I watch MSNBC. But when I talk to my friends who are right of center, they read Breitbart News and they watch Fox News. And so I worry sometimes that maybe we're not having the same political discussion. And what is your opinion? So my view is that one way to move forward would be for people from each side to try out the other news sources, which seems like a really simple recommendation, but you give it a try, um, and then you find that it actually can raise your blood pressure a little bit. Um, but I think raising your, your blood pressure a little bit to try to have a conversation with someone who disagrees with you is probably a worthwhile thing to do, and in some ways is the essence of American democracy. Great point. How much your blood pressure has changed? <laughs> well, um, I'm not going to get into my medical records, uh, um, but I'll just say that I think I've done some learning through it, and it's been a little bit worthwhile. Great point. I'll let the, uh, not the candidates, I'll let the panelists uh, later respond to that. And any other points? My name is Ella. I'm from New York, um, but I am a child of immigrants from China and Taiwan. Um, so my um, Ricky here is completely right about how there's a divide in the types of media sources that people are reading and consuming nowadays, especially among young people. And I think one way to alleviate that is to really um, just have people get to know each other from different sides of the political spectrum. And I think that sounds easy, but it actually is sometimes quite difficult, even in places like America, where people live in very different places and they don't always interact with people who have different political views uh, from them. So I think one way that I as a New Yorker who lives in a place that you know, tends to lean very liberal try to do to understand people who are supporting Trump was read news articles about 
uh, personal testimonies from people who are voting from him. And I genuinely saw that there were some very good reasons for them to voting the way they were. They were suffering a lot from economic poverty, from very difficult situations. And so once I saw that, I sort of understand where they were coming from, and I hope that going forward, I can be one of the people in the country who can reach out to them and understand where they're from, and maybe even eventually enter politics in some way to sort of um, help these people out as Great well. Great point over there. Anyone who also from outside is want to have a say about the, what's going on? Hi, I'm uh, Ross from Australia. Um, one thing that I find interesting is in Australia we actually have a system of compulsory voting. So every single person has to vote unless they have a very good reason or they will have a fine. Um, and one interesting thing observing world politics is that uh, often it's a minority of the population as a whole that actually votes for these extremist candidates. And perhaps one uh, good feature of our system that I think uh, might be very difficult to implement in reform across the world given how difficult electoral reform is, um, is a compulsory system of voting because at least in Australia it means that the politicians aren't just trying to motivate their base or their, their, their more extreme left or right voters to come out, they actually have to target the middle, um, the swing voters. So it moderates political uh, opinions and I guess political policies towards the center a little bit more. Many great points we have picked up from the audience members. What about some of the points you want to comment or respond to? I think Ricky's point is very interesting about how uh, media is becoming more uh, divisive. I think we have the freedom now to choose how we want to be informed, uh, in which way, and from whom. I think the more choices we have, uh, it's very interesting and it, it helps us shape uh, a richer discussion also. Mm -hmm. And David? Um, Any points? Society is divided, but it is politicians' responsibility to stick them together. That's why we need special people focusing on the policies, on the issues, on how to find the common interest between groups of people. And we can't just say we want media to do something because media, they are independent. And you can't count on them to follow such policies. But it is the presidents, the parties that to find the common interest. That's All my right, opinion. we're going to have some of you to debate later off mm -hmm. camera, I guess, about that point. <laughs> but so what about you, Juliana? I think Rugsid makes a great point. Also, it's that it's not just about who wins the election, but the precedents that they start setting and the actions that they start taking. I think it was Henry Kissinger that said the stability of Asia depends on the cooperation of the U.S.-China relationship. And I think that there's going to be a lot of challenges and opportunities that face the next president in terms of building that relationship and restoring a trust. And you are watching Election Breakdown, a special program of World Insight on CCTV News. We are here to break down the U.S. presidential election, to analyze that from young voices and voters from all over the world, and also to seek solutions and answers about what kind of political leadership we need for the future. Is China taking away the jobs? The issue is the United States also enjoy the fruit of globalization. The relationship between the United States and China, the two biggest powers, has to be good. Like you guys. Yeah, yeah. and seeing the Together. $110 here. Talking about the election, one of the most important things people look at, of course, China-U.S. relations. What do you think? Some say there has been so much political bashing. I always joke with my friends, and I'm proud of this, because it means China is how are you going to expect uh, a candidate from the United States president to mention China 10 times, 20 times during their debates? Let's say China. 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 People from China, they love me. China. Actually, I don't care so much about the criticism raised during the debates, during the campaign, because most United States presidents, they turned to criticize China during their campaign, but took a very practical policy dealing with China during their terms. So you're really cool with that, mm, I, no matter how harsh they are verbally about China. In, in, in Chinese, there's another saying that if you're strong enough, you don't care people's criticism. <laughs> Okay, well, Juliana, what do you think? Well, I think despite some of the candidates' rhetoric, you see Hillary Clinton known to be hard on China, at least in terms of security and human rights. And on the other hand, you see Trump accusing of currency manipulation and uh, threatening trade wars. But I think what we really should be focusing on is the points of joint collaboration that have been made. You're seeing a huge point where they're focusing right now on energy and climate change. And how can both of those countries work together on points that 
are going to be easy for them to first start that relationship. Mm. You sound like a diplomat. I guess so. Right, <laughs> fresh out of the oven from the American <laughs> Embassy here in Beijing. And Thomas, from a third party observer's perspective, now you are the insignificant, supposed to be quote unquote, the third party. No, go ahead. Yes, so I think what they're doing is actually a very old technique, is trying to find a common enemy abroad to make people forget their, their problems inside. Uh, and I, I don't know why, but we still over... It worked! Yeah, over and over and over again, we still fall for that. And it's very dangerous because when you get to come to China, as we've been living here for over two months, you get to see that China is, from the outside, is portrayed as this huge country, this huge economy that will take over the world, and also military. But when you come here, you realize that China, as, as is any other country, is composed by families, by people that work very hard to give their families a better future, a better education. And uh, I've been really amazed by, by finding this living here. Uh, for the national holidays with a, with a group of friends, we set off from Beijing by train all the way uh, to Urumqi. Wow, uh, in, in the Xinjiang. Northwest, exactly. Uh -huh. uh, by train uh, following the, the old Silk Road. And we're amazed uh, to see that in every city and s small oasis that we will stop along the way, we, uh, we stayed in their houses, we talked to local families. In, in, in Turpan, we went uh, to a Tuyuk uh, village in the mountains, that's from the Uyghur ethnicity in China, and we got to stay with them in their house uh, to eat and also to sleep. And just seeing them interact with their families, there were uh, a couple of families living together, raising their kids together, sharing meals with us. We realized that sometimes there are politicians, the ones who try to face us and make us think that we're enemies, but we're, we're the same people. We have, as I was saying, the same beliefs, the same kindness, the same things that unite us and not divide us in the end. We've been so grateful to be here at Schwarzman Scholars. There's been so many great late night conversations actually. Dave and I had a conversation where we were talking about government and what are the metrics of success. Is it conversation or is it debate to be exact? I think it's civil Both. discussion. <laughs> yeah. Both. Okay, tell us more about that discussion. I think that discussion was really important. We were electing people for our student government here and we were trying to figure out what is the best process to elect people within our own scholar community. And really what we ended up deciding is that we are rooted in very different cultures and we have different ways that we think of a government being successful, whether that the uh, representative of the electorate or effective. Mm -hmm. And when we were able to discuss that and see we came from different perspectives, I think that was a really poignant moment for me because we were able to talk and express our opinions but realize that we also came from different Representative or effective? Which is more important to you, David? Uh, I chose efficiency because China, not only about cultural factors, because in certain stage of development, you focus on efficiency. When the society is developed, when the productivity is high enough, you can take the burden to make more costly solutions about selecting officials. So that's why I regard the, the mission is different. Mm -hmm. mm. And you? And I think it's about representation. Everyone should have the ability to vote and voice their opinion. Mm -hmm. Juliana, I know you just came to China two months. Is China still a fear to you? I don't think it has ever been a fear to me. But how come many people back at home think China is the fear? I think it's that basic economic principle in that wages are going down, we haven't seen much growth since the Great Recession, and it's natural to jump to that conclusion, even though I don't ascribe to it, that jobs are moving to Asia, jobs are moving to China. You look at your clothing, it says made in China. And so I think it's natural to jump to that conclusion if you don't have the full spectrum of the picture. Is China taking away the jobs? It is possible to say that because China do have much cheaper labor. But the issue is United States also enjoy the fruit of globalization because we provide goods in such a lower price. Possibly the stress is made in China. And, uh, and in 20 years ago, in the 1990s, when, I, when my uncle was in the States, he bought a model of Statue of Liberty. He bring that back as a gift to me in the back set, made in China. That's 20 years ago. Even if China is not rising, we have Indians, we have Vietnams, they have cheap labor. So it is important to, for the politicians to divide the pies of globaliz globalization equally among different groups of people in the United mm. States. Mm -hmm. I think it's a question of how are we going to deal with globalization and figure out movements of labor, movement of capital, what is exactly happening there and being able to educate people. Is it related to technology? Is it related to China? And really being able to describe those differences Deglobalization, that has been a word used pretty often these days, meaning people see 
the negative effect, as they see it, of the globalization. They think there are bigger benefiters, there are smaller benefiters, or someone who is not benefiting at all from globalization. Thomas, you're coming from Argentina. It's a very different economy compared to China's or the U.S. My understanding is that countries should look at each other as partners and not as enemies or, or someone who will steal jobs from your economy because actually thanks to globalization... Well, you are coming from a developing country, emerging country. Yeah. Of course you would say that, Giuliano would argue. <laughs> no, but, well, we also, some people back home also say that China <coughs> is, is, more, is cheaper and it's more efficient and we always think uh, that other industrialized countries take advantage of our country because it's developing, which I don't think is true. Actually, I think the world is becoming more interconnected and we have to play to our strength and develop ourselves to be a part of this and help other countries. For example, back home, we are very efficient in producing food. And I'm very proud of that because we're helping feed uh, China, for example. China mm -hmm. is one of, of our course. main partners mm -hmm. in trade. And uh, What kind of things are you exporting to China? Uh, for example, soybeans. Mm. Uh, that's very important for, uh, and it's very uh, interesting because in my country we don't consume soybeans at all. Not one single soybean. However, it's one of the main exports that we have and revenue for a country and provide of people their work and their livelihood. And without globalization, a lot of people would find themselves without jobs back at home. And China is not having an easy time, I have to say, David. I don't know what is your observation, but economic restructuring, that has been the thing that China has been talking about over the past few years. The question is how well China has been doing it. Would China be able to equip its own laborers who used to be doing the skirt or the cheap exports to the United States and elsewhere to upgrade the manufacturing and go into the next stage of globalization? Uh, David, what is your observation? Uh the f after financial crisis of 2008, you see that happening because suddenly the demand from the West, uh, United States or European Union, dramatically, and a lot of uh, small factories in the Eastern Code are went, went to bank went, went bankrupt. You sound like uh, a real economist. <laughs> <laughs> However, you, when you look at uh, people's life, it's not that uh, materially affected. We still have movies from the United States. We still use iPhones. The problem is Chinese young people; they don't have fear for the United States because because they grow up watching Friends, grow up watching Big Bang Theory, they know Sheldon is their favorite nurse. Okay. And for, uh, for I confess, you watch more than I did. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, because we are living in the internet age, which we like. So uh, the problem actually is how to deal with domestic issues while maintaining the balance between countries. That's more important, in my opinion. Are you concerned if policies toward China, as a young Chinese coming from China, Toward, uh, from the United States getting ever sharper against China, ever stronger against China? I do believe, to be practical, U.S. won't be too harsh on us because all these exports to China of high tech and also when you look at the tourists, the average people spending in the U.S. from China is about 6,000 U.S. dollar, which is 30% uh, more than the average of foreign, foreign tourists. So I think we have too much shared interest that we can find ways to work out. People to people, is that really the solution, Juliana? I think it really is the solution. I think like also, you guys, yeah, here. and seeing the here. 110 scholars here, we talk about political leadership, but there are also people that are leaders in medicine and trade and education that are really creating those joint ventures, I think, across U.S. and China, really. Do your friends back at home really curious ask you through Facebook, for example, what is China like? Yeah, I think China is very opaque. As David said, a lot of our media is going to China and a lot of students are coming to the United States, but you're not seeing the flows in the opposite directions. And I think being a student in China is giving me that exposure that I need to be able to tell my friends at home, this is what the experience is really like. This is what happened today. These are the interactions that I'm having, whether that be with someone on Tsinghua's campus who's a freshman or talking to someone who owns a fruit stand or just meeting someone on the street and asking them about their daily life. How important is it for you, Thomas? Of course, we're talking about U.S.-China relations, but of course, not limited to that, the two countries. If the countries get on well with one another or the other way around, what would that mean for you from elsewhere in the world? The relationship between the United States and China, the two biggest powers, has to be good. Trade and, and, and also the glo globalization and be becoming more connected has made the world safer, not less safer in history. And trade has, been, has played a major role in that. So I think the United States and China have a responsibility to figure their relationship out and try to make it work. Because if they drift apart, 
that can only cause the world to be less safe than it already is. All right, I can see the three of you are all for a good relation between China and the United States, and you're a globalization hugger. <laughs> well, the two of you also have your different views about globalization and how problems should be amended. Let's go to our audience. There was a segment on Bill O'Reilly's show、um, that was that was interviewing some people in Chinatown、um, and pretty clearly mocking their their、uh, lack of the English. Um, understanding the English language and their lack of understanding about elections, when really they were just not being approached in a very friendly way. And so, actually, what was really encouraging to me, although the original segment was extremely offensive and unfair to the to the citizens and living in Chinatown, was that. The amount of young people, but also just people in general of all different ages, who came out on social media, who came out on,、um, who came out on different forums, on you know they were parodies of that segment. 美国总统大选，你有什么意见？这是很特别。啊，其实呢呢呢一届嘅美国美国啊，两个都系废。咪就是说一个 ，you adversary， 那这个很危险嘛。为什么你当美国政治方面 ？I'm from Queens. And I think that was very encouraging and very hopeful. Did you also? Did I also? Did you also talk about that with your friends? Yeah, I mean, I like liked every single status that was criticizing that segment. <laughs> so I, while I don't particularly like post long statuses on Facebook very much, I think that it was very nice to see all my friends who were, and I was just supporting them all the way. My name is Wang Zhe from China. We are talking about leadership. I think a good leader should not of the anger, of the fear, of the complaints of the public, but they should. Try to how do they try to help them to figure out a solution and to unite them. Hello, my name is Bonnie, and I'm also from the United States. And I think another aspect that's really important about U.S. and China relations is the、um, the impact that it can have on solving some of the world's biggest challenges. So I'm talking about things such as climate change, like Juliana alluded to earlier, and also things like infectious diseases and pandemics. And these are challenges that really don't recognize any global boundaries, any human-made boundaries. And this is going to affect nations across, and is going to require a lot of cooperation across nations. You are watching Election Breakdown. That is a special program, a World Insight on CCTV News. We are here to analyze the ongoing U.S. presidential elections, the takeaways, and the qualities of future leaders of the world. Are they game changers? And with the hateful and divisive campaign that he has run, he's got tremendous hatred. When they go low, you go high. Well, well, well. But these millennials are. We are rising voices. Get a glimpse of tomorrow's young leaders. What are the issues that interest you the most? Trying to find a common enemy abroad. China-U.S. relations. It's going to hurt China and also hurt the United States. That they join us to unravel the U.S. election wranglings. Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump. But、so、I think Trump has been an outlier in this election. We call them now populists. Election breakdown on World Insight. You're watching Election Breakdown, a special program of World Insight on CCTV News. We're here with the younger generation of leaders of our world. Leaders that are able to capitalize on networks and understand how they work are really going to be the leaders of tomorrow. Because we have to accept the reality that we're living in an interconnected age. I also think leaders need to be practical and focused on policy proposals. It's one thing to say something; it's another thing to follow through with actions and really think about how that can happen. And that's the difficult part, but that's why you become a leader. One of Qinghua's motto is "behavior is much more influential than words." So I think、uh, leaders around the world today they need to make things happen. Actions speak louder than words. That's another way to address that, of、okay. course. <laughs> But、uh, just remind remind me of、uh, one of my senior classmates who、uh, he graduated from Peking University with a, such a high degree, prestige degree. But he chose to go to a very very small village in in southern part of China in Guangxi. Uh, when I saw him on TV advertising for the for the green products in that county, he's all tainted. You know, he used to be such a you know. You, you see, he's a PhD, really like a PhD with the glasses, but now it's all dark dark faces.、Mm -hmm. So he trying to make his belief happen. He addresses that people from whatever part of China they have a chance to get their wealth, get their well beings, and they are trying to persuade things. They're trying to conduct his dream there inside the village. 
So I think that's much more important than just speaking with splendid words. Mm. So leadership is about actions. Yep. What about you, Thomas? Is this election really help us to understand better about leadership? I think, I think so. I think so. Because I think the world needs now more leaders that are, are less trying to go with the wind of politics and have, on the, uh, instead of having that, is having a more profound uh, set of principles and values that they hold very dearly. Um, so that's why I very admire Teng Xiaoping, for example, because he was a, a Chinese leader that did the right, did, um, took some actions at a time where there was very difficult to, for him to do so, took some risk. And right after the Cultural Revolution, exactly. he talked about reform and opening up. Yes, exactly. And he even risked his own comfortable position to pursue the change that he thought, honestly, that was necessary. It would have been much easier for him just to go with the flow, as many other politicians nowadays do, but he chose to do that. And for example, another one that I think we should have more of is Nelson Mandela, because he was uh, sent to prison for 27 years in South Africa for, for fighting for what he thought it was just just for that. And when he got out of prison after 27 years, uh, many South Africans asked them and, and requested him that he took revenge on the white people who had done that to him and to many other South African citizens. But he said that a true leader has to tell the people uh, when they're wrong also. And so he refused to do that and he proceeded to reunite the people in South Africa. Qualities of political leadership, it sounds like a big topic, but it's so important for every one of us. Hi, my name is Hayden. I'm from Canada. Uh, I just wanted to add to, to what uh, Tomas, uh, David and Juliana have already enumerated in terms of leadership qualities. One thing that I think has run throughout this discussion and that's empathy. I think uh, success requires a real effort at identification with the people that you purport to represent. Um, and, and that's something that we're seeing, you know, whether through the U.S. election or our discussion about uh, U.S.-China relations. Uh, it's very difficult to have success as a leader if you're not willing to go that extra step. So on the one hand, the qualities of leadership, but on the other hand, being grounded, how do you see that relationship? Um, I, I think the point about privilege is very important and, and the issue that you raised about us uh, being in an elite environment, many of us have already had an elite education for some years. Um, not all of us are necessarily you know, upper class. Many of us I know have, have come from scholarships, but I think uh, something that's extremely important is to be self-aware of one's privilege and also to be aware that maybe what is in our personal interests is not in the interests of those that we should be representing. Um, it ties back to the, you know, the US election issue. There's so many people that have been disenfranchised or feel disenfranchised, not just in the US but around the world, because I think you know, the global elite has genuinely perhaps forgotten to take uh, into consideration their concerns, uh, their well-being, and I think it's incumbent upon us as the next generation of uh, hopeful young leaders uh, to perhaps make sure that we don't repeat those mistakes. I think as a leader, being grounded is very important. While it is a privilege for us to receive just a quality education, we also feel a sense of responsibility to get to know the people that we will be representing when, if we do as well in the future, become a future leader, to be sitting in the most prestigious situations to be making decisions that would make impact all around the world. And when we make those decisions, most likely it's going to be behind closed doors in a, sit in a setting removed from context. And the only thing that we will have with us would be our background, our education, the, our experiences, our conversations with the people, with these contexts. But sometimes knowing more different perspectives about one thing would make you hesitate to make a decision. However, the people also argue when it comes to political leadership, you have to be decisive all the time. So what do you make up these two sides of the same issue? I think a little hesitation is necessary. When you make instinctive decisions, oftentimes you, that's when most mistakes occur. So always have the ability to second guess yourself, even for a little bit. Even that slight hesitation can be helpful in preventing these mistakes from occurring. You think these are very important qualities of political leadership? I do think so, yes. All right. The benefits and the interests of your own community vis-a-vis -vis the benefits and interests of, let's just say, others, how can the political leader make the choice? I think that's, it's a series of calculations, um, and it's not always necessarily a trade-off. I think you can make decisions that are good for the whole, while also representing in a faithful way the voice of the community that you represent. Uh, it's definitely probably one of the main challenges of being a leader. We talk about leadership, 
So really, the future, I guess, depends on all of us to be built.、Uh, But the question is, what kind of future we want? I'm Jordan from the U.S., and I just would kind of echo Max's point here that this is not a zero-sum game. The future that we're working towards, which is, I think, why we're all here, is that we believe getting to know each other and building these connections and getting to empathize not only with our constituents but also with those who we impact is going to be a defining way in which leadership changes and shapes our generation.、Mm, great point. Even though very abstract. <laughs> I'm Zhao Chuang from China. In this community, we are very excellent. And it's not、uh, not just、uh, how excellent you are, but what response you take, what courage you take to solve the problem. We talk about election breakdown. We are here to analyze the election ongoing in the United States, hoping that it would shed some light for us about politics these days and what can we learn about it, and also. What kind of future we want? At the end of the discussion, I want to come back and rely on your strengths. I think that we have to realize that the leaders of tomorrow need to be humble and also need to balance domestic wants with global interconnectedness. And I think that's going to be a trade-off that's going to consistently occur and going to be something that leaders are going to have to deal with. There's a Chinese saying. Please allow me to address another Chinese <laughs> saying: "Is 君子和而不同 Meaning, noble people are in constant harmonious disagreement. It is important that we realize we are different, and we have to work this disagreement out to achieve things that we want. And I want to live in a world in a world where where you're born, the color of your skin, the language you speak, or your culture doesn't make a difference in in your ability to follow your dreams and、um, make them a reality. This has really been a very resourceful discussion for me, and I'm sure for our audience from all over the world listening. To your voices, frank, energetic, looking forward to the future. What our future should be like. I think, ladies and gentlemen, we deserve a warm round of applause for ourselves, don't we? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. I think we are the rising, rising voices. voices. Thank you. Thank you so much. And with that, we are coming to the end of a special program, World Inside Election Breakdown. We are looking forward to the result of the U.S. presidential election. More importantly, we are looking forward to building our future leadership. Thank you so much. I'm Tian Wei. Thank you for watching.